So welcome, Richard. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Mm, thank you so much. I really enjoy learning and participating in your community and uh, life itself. I, I watched a number of hours of videos um, that you presented at uh, Limicon a month ago. I think it was a month ago. And then I went on to your website trying to get a sense of what you guys are up to. And some things that came out were the second renaissance movement and conscious collectives. And um, it's kind of like this, I've noticed that there's this tension, it's probably not a tension, but it's between um, problem identification and solution, solutioning, you know? And I, I think um, what my presentation or sharing, it's not really formal, um, is going to be mostly about uh, some solutions that I have experience with um, in, in the Western context, urban Western cities, as well as a developing country of Sri Lanka and Asia, and then going back, kind of pointing out some other um, important um, community movements, you know, that work at the grassroots. So I, I think I'll just start, I think you, you had sent me some notes regarding some suggestions, Lauren, about uh, covering. I think I'll just start with the basics, like what the heck is symbiotic culture? So I'll just start out with at least an attempt at a definition. And it's, it's a society and culture where intentional mutual benefit from person to family, to neighborhood, to organization, local community, to nation, to the world, where that intentional mutual benefit becomes normal. Just imagine that. It, I mean, it is hard to imagine how, how, would we, how would we get there from where we're at. And I don't think I need to you know, introduce the why question. I think, I think most in your community are just really, you know, you know, steeped in understanding and motivating, motivated um, to understand why why something like that would be important in this. I, I guess a uh, popular phrase, time between worlds, and it is like that. <clears throat> and um, I'd like to share today how it is possible to build a local community movement that interfaces with the existing, what I call culture of separation, but independent of it. So it's, inter, it's interdependent because it's where things are happening in local communities. And many people, most people aren't, aren't aware of what's happening, but it's using that energy, local economy, local organizations, but how to stay independent of it to build a new culture in parallel, new, new parallel society, parallel culture, parallel economy and politics, starting at the local level. And it's not like an exponential idea to go from one community and then you know, a year later, then you're in two and then four and then eight. The idea is a fractal one. I'm gonna share what I call a fractal empow community empowerment approach where I believe it would be possible to have thousands of communities, real communities emerging, awakening and developing themselves in this way simultaneously. I know that may sound crazy or overly optimistic, but aren't we all practical utopians or protopians here? So I'm, I'm gonna get into that um, I'm real excited to share. It's it's based on my actual experience. I'm not a philosopher. I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, actually, I'm a businessman, but also I've run, you know, uh, nonprofits, charities you know, in the past. And I'm going to share from my real experience, really what started 50 years ago with a spiritual awakening at the age of 12. Uh, so it's actually 52 years, so I'm, I'm 60, 64. Um, 
and then how that experience kind of drew me into a question that I believe many of us are asking, like, what the hell's going on? And then as my father, when I was a kid, once said to me when I was sharing this question, he goes, well, what are you going to do about it when you wake up in the morning? And, it, and he didn't realize that he was giving me like marching orders for how to ground what could be really beautiful ideas that come from our hearts and comes really, I think it's been on the hearts of humanity for forever. You know, the vision of a beloved community. So I think best thing to do, I'd like to start talking about an actual example and describe maybe in a couple minutes um, why it's important uh, before I go into my own experience. So I'd like to talk about the Sarvodia Shramadana movement in Sri Lanka. It's a 65 year old movement began in 1958. And I think I'm gonna mention it simply because the founder who was 92 just passed a couple weeks ago when I, I went to Sri Lanka for the funeral and he had an amazing impact on millions of people. And after the kind of cremation, the, the ceremony outside, which was basically with thousands of people and they had like a, you know, it was a wood fire and a tent and they, you know, they burned the whole thing. And afterwards, someone came up to me, it was actually a relative of Dr. Ari. And he said, could you explain how it's possible that you can start in a small village and then eventually have 15,000 communities emerging in a connected ecosystem network in a nation, in a country. And about 5,000 of those villages and towns actually had more formal organizations and 3,000 of them were financially self-sufficient with their own banking system and parallel culture. And I've been thinking about that and that's something I can get to in Q&A but that, that's kind of the, the opening um, regarding Sarvodia. And I, I wanted to kind of indicate some of the shared principles and ideas that ground the Sarvodia movement, like what unites it, what, what, what's the driver? How do you actually on a practical level build a parallel culture movement? And I'm not saying this is the only answer. It definitely is an answer. And it's inspired me for 35 years to work to translate those principles and operations and processes uh, into the West. So Sarvodia, like I said, is a village-based awakening movement. And the essential, I guess, shared uh, values or virtues, it's Essentially, it's like an equation in my mind because I'm trained as a scientist. I'm a biologist um, by training. Um, so it's basically the four Buddhist sublime abodes, which are compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, and joy in oneself and joy in the joy of in others to bring joy to others. So those are four, let's just call them virtues or principles. And they've discovered a way to integrate what they call personality awakening at the level of the individual person with greater and expanding spheres of collective action, starting with the person, then the family, then the village, and then the region, the nation, and the world. So I want you to imagine this in the 60s, in a, in a sense, many weren't literate. Imagine these villagers in, in a South Asian context, you know, the poorest of the poor, applying these principles in action in a way that is seamlessly integrated and one whole. It's hard to even imagine that because in the West, spirituality, and religion is seemed to be separate and an individual pursuit. So if you're a churchgoer, it's salvation. If you're a, like a spiritual but not religious person, you might call it awakening or enlightenment, but it's still 
separate. It's like a separate practice is that's me. It's my self awakening, like self actualization. It makes no sense to me because is there a separate self to actualize? Is there a separate self separate from other community members? This is the, the trap that we in the West have gotten to after 400 years post enlightenment, which I understand this is on the hearts and minds of the life itself community, like really deeply getting into these questions. But here's a movement, Sarvodia, where they've seamlessly integrated spirituality and community as one seamless whole. So that's the one thing that's amazing about it. The other is actualization or awakening is not the end point as it is in the West. If you follow Maslow's hierarchy of needs, awakening, that is spiritual awakening, personality awakening is the foundation of their work. So it's not like you, you kind of evolve through these stages, like, you know, like Maslow's hierarchy, where say you want to deal with hunger as an issue. It, it's not like, oh yeah, well, we have to, we have to evolve to this higher level before we can address hunger. No, they're doing it seamlessly together and they do it in a community context. So there's no individuals separate from other individuals in the community and organizations are all doing this together. They're waking up together. And that's really amazing. So that's the first part, the shared of virtues, the action, they've created a functional context of what they call 10 basic human needs. So these are things that are pretty much not like high intellectual sophistication. These are like food, energy, water, housing, education, spiritual and cultural needs, communication, those kinds of things. That's the context that they operate, that they take the virtues and the spiritual energy and the power that comes through the practice and it's applied in concrete um, functional contexts, growing more local food and consuming more local food, you know, developing a parallel banking financial system, you know, uh, building roads and businesses and preschools and banks. So it's very concrete. So that's shared values, virtues and principles or in needs. Then they have the principles they have would be they're building a parallel society and culture consciously and intentionally and, and it's public. It's not weird. It's not odd. It's just what their objective is. It doesn't mean they don't interact with the existing, say, local uh, civic government, you know, the official government that's part of their federal system. They definitely are interacting with it, but they're clear that they're creating a parallel cultural context. And the principles that are very important are to build up local economies, starting with the person, with they call Swaraj, which is self-rule, self-governance. And self-governance then extends to the family and the village. So their goal would be village self-governance, village self-sufficiency in the economic system. And this is currently happening more or less in those 5,000 towns in a network. And it is fractal in a sense, and it is what they call multi-scalar in a sense that it happens at different scales. That is, it's horizontal within a village and a community, and then it goes between communities and there's a uh, coordination mechanism that can uh, support every uh, community starting geographically wherever they are. So that's shared virtues, shared need, common needs. And um, the, the last thing I just shared was these, these principles. So then the question is, well, how do they build infrastructure? So they're conscious at levels and scale. So personal, family, and village, and nation are the primary scales. And within each uh, village context, which is the, the, that's, the um, that's the area that they're building in. It's not an echo village that's too small. It's not a bioregion, which would be the entire country. It's the level of the village, which is a Goldilocks zone. And they're building social, cultural, 
spiritual, economic, and political infrastructure in very tangible ways. So they're conscious of all these things. I just want you to imagine this because it's hard to believe. Because in the West, my the reaction I'm getting from people is like, yeah, that sounds like a nice idea, but there's not really an understanding of how deep it is. It, it really impacted me on a fundamental level. Uh, so that's some overview of what they've done and they've achieved I can, you know, there's no point in going through the list of like thousands of, you know, preschools and banks and all the things that they've created. But it impacted me so much. So in, about 35 years ago, I began to implement that first in San Diego, California in the U.S. And then more so in Reno, Nevada. And just to kind of fast forward, what, what's the uh, time, uh, Lauren? You've got about five minutes left if okay. you wish. This, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to introduce some of these concepts. So just want to share how I've translated that as a, as a basis for moving forward. So I'm trying to orient this towards solution. Was it solutioneering? <laughs> so being more uh, focusing on solutions. So the way I translated Sarvodia, what's really interesting is the virtues in Sri Lanka obviously are coming from a more homogenous South Asian Buddhist context. But in the West, in the US, we have a pluralistic, multi-religious and secular uh, context. That's the first thing that you, we have to look at that's different than Sri Lanka. The other thing that's different is when they started that movement, they didn't have infrastructure, like a lot of farms, roads. So they had to apply their personality awakening in the context of building stuff that we in the West would take for granted. So the way I translated that since we don't really need to, um, we don't need more stuff. The insight I had is we have like in Reno at the time, we had like 20 organizations trying to solve the problem of homelessness, but there's just no way, there's just no way that you can solve the problem of homelessness in a siloed based structure where you have 20 competing and sometimes collaborating organizations. Impossible because the problems of homelessness are related to a variety of other challenges, employment, unemployment, poverty, and all the other lit, uh, litany. So instead of building infrastructure, what, what I saw that we needed to do was not do a project like a community garden or a restaurant if in the food area. Why not build a network of all of the existing entities from conventional to regenerative, all the different organizations, the businesses, local government. So long story short, you know, over a period of 25 years, I think I've built like five different networks. One was like peace and safety in a kind of a drug dealing, violent neighborhood in San Diego, and then build a local living economy network, local food system network, arts and culture network, and then supported an interfaith movement. And these are all in the context of building um, meta networks. So these are meta network constructs. It, it's not like the collective is forcing an individual organization and leader or citizen to like get in line. It's a seamless integration of the needs of each organization, leader and entity that's already doing good in a community. And they voluntarily choose to be part of a larger construct that gives them value and uplifts the community at the same time. Now, I've come from more of a spiritual context, and in the Q&A, I can share how that's integrated there. So what we've come up with is a translation of five shared virtues, eight principles, 12 community needs, a way of building infrastructure like these networks, both process, like how do you do it step-by-step step, and structure. How do you build a structure, a network structure to do good and connecting the good without itself becoming a silo and reproducing the culture of separation? How do you do that? Well, it took me 40 years to figure it out. It's not an easy question. And I, I just dove right into it, probably because I, yeah, maybe I'm on the spectrum a little, and I say that in a good way, probably. I mean, can you imagine focusing on something like, just like, boom. So it's more of a calling uh, to me. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think that might be enough uh, to maybe generate a dialogue. Um, and I really appreciate being here with you because I'm, 
I'm offering this right now. I'm releasing my book as an online uh, uh, digital series on Substack. And I'm, I'm basically sharing what I know, what works and what doesn't work to be in support of organizations and networks like life itself. So I'm not offering something to compete with what you or anybody else is doing. This is more, think of it more like a cultural uh, engagement awakening tool you can put in your tool set amongst all the other things that you're doing. It doesn't have to change your basic nature of your group or your network. It's actually enhancement for those that are interested in it. So that's how I can envision working with local or I mean global networks, national networks, um, especially if they want to develop a community, like a chapter, you know what I mean? Like if they want to develop their own kind of get local people within that global network together, this could be one aspect of, of, you know, cool things to, to do. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. I'm sure there are lots of questions or comments that, that people might want to, to ask you. So I'm going to hand over to individuals to, to come forward, or if people can't unmute to share, you're welcome to type it in the chat. You can ask on your behalf. Um, <clears throat> hello, um, good evening, good morning, wherever anyone is from. Um, thanks for sharing, Richard. Um, I'm interested in how has your findings um, been expressed in the relationships you have? Um, and yeah, how has it been at all for deepening with relationships or existing communities in your local space and yeah you can extrapolate on that or do whatever you wish with that question cool. you, you mean uh, let me ask you something uh, james to clarify um do you mean cool. uh, how do you go about connecting and relating to others who might be interested in doing this kind of work how does that evolve uh, how does that develop but tell me more um i i'm interested in your kind of your personal relationships. So for instance, an example could be uh, in visiting Sri Lanka and ex like experiencing these communities. Uh, is there anything that you've taken from that and apply to your relationships um, where you live and how does that unfold? Is that a mm -hmm. bit more clear? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it's an interesting question because having a desire to work in community, like where you live, like a physical uh, uh, region. The foundation of it is this de a desire to unify the separate parts and connecting the good already happening, right? So the challenge is that you don't know what it is that's hidden within ourselves, like a shadow. Not that it's bad, it's just hidden. For example, when I started doing that work, um, <laughs> it's really interesting, but I was, to some extent, had negative feelings about business because I was conflating corporate large scale business with the local uh, community, like mom and pops business that we might interact with. So I had to work through that. I thought to myself, well, if I'm gonna unify the community, it's gotta include everybody and every entity and I've gotta overcome whatever it is that was holding me back. It turns out it was some hidden, probably a left, left of center political bias that I had that I wasn't aware of. So that was one thing. Another was, if it's hard to believe maybe, but even though I had these early religious and spiritual experiences, I found that I was maybe still had some wounding regarding organized religion. And then I did the same process. I realized, wow, if I want to unify the community, I've got to deal with my wounded nature. So the way I did that was to attend every worship service of every type of religious and spiritual organization over a year long period. So then I started meeting people individually as people and not as part of their institution, that forward, you know, front looking so that 
Then the last thing I want to share is, and I hope I'm doing my best to answer your question, is that I, what I've realized too is for me, I pretty much had been externally directed on this mission in the community. And I realized that I might not have been as present for my own family. It's the classic case of somebody who's like building a large business or building, you know, like community work and that dynamic. I'm still dealing with this right now, realizing this. And the irony of it all is I'm going to probably release my book in September, early September. So I, I know this sounds like an imposition, but I want to bring more balance to my personal life as I'm sharing this with the world. Because I've been opening my heart to the world for, yeah, 50 years, like literally opening my heart to see the, and, and, and to have this call. But I'm realizing before I publish my book, I'm going to have balance with my family and to spend more quality time with, especially my son and my daughter and my wife, especially. And I'm not going to publish my book before I achieve that. I'll say be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite. So that's driving me. I actually think about this. I literally, I, I can't do it. I, what's the point of talking about love and community and building all this stuff? If I can't do this in my family, for gosh sakes, it's not that I've been negligent, but it's just more balance. So that's how the importance of these virtues, these virtues within us are a constellation of, of really different energies compassion, compassion for oneself, compassion for your family, for the community, um, wisdom, sharing, generosity, patience, truthfulness, integrity, restraint. These all go together. And they're like a constellation of beautiful transcendent energies that can help us to bring order to ourselves, unify our personality, so that we can then help to unify greater collectives around us. And this is a dynamic that's back and forth. That's the praxis of it. And that's, that's a, it's not a project I'm doing. It's not a, it's not like a separate organization. I'm not building that. I'm sharing a way of life, a way of living that, that um, I'm experimenting you know, like all of us are experimenting and I want to share um, authentically with, with you. And I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Hope I answered your question, uh, James. Um, yes, yes, you did. Um, thank you for sharing. Awesome. We've got Bella with our hands up. Bella, would you like to go? Yeah, thanks. Hi. Thanks so much, Richard. And I just, I'm cooking in the background, so <laughs> apologies for the, um, any tense and sounds, but yeah, I just might have to jump in at that. Thank you so much for sharing um, that, like, you know, really sort of vulnerable and um, yeah. And I just really resonate with that because um, a lot of the stuff I've been doing for, you know, these pro-democracy movements and it's all around deliberative democracy and I've been joining James's intentional society workshops around, you know, conversational theories of dialogue, etc. Whereas meanwhile, in the family home, you know, I don't speak with my younger brother, like, he's blocked me, I've blocked my dad on, on WhatsApp. So there are these, you know, real blockages of communication within a very small family unit in, yeah, in, in my home, but then it's, I've started to think about this too, and reflect, like, how can I possibly be so passionate about you know you know all these conversational theories of dialogue and deliberative democracy and citizens assemblies and how people connect and communicate with each other through discussion and dialogue when I struggle to even do that in my immediate family and I wonder whether there's something and I don't know it's chicken and egg I don't know what you know how it how it came about with you but I wonder if that's something maybe it's because of that we're so passionate to you know, drive it forward in, in the outside world because it's something we really want, but we're expressing it outside rather than inside. I'm not sure. It's really interesting, but thank you. Welcome. Yeah, I, I think it's, maybe it's, it's just uh, being able to see 
the inner life and the exterior life as one common multidimensional reality that we're in. And to, to through time, identify the areas of ourselves that, that what could be like shadow, you could call it shadow material, just that which is hidden. Um, certainly, to one extent or another, we're all traumatized by life, by family, by experience in the world. It's intergenerational, it goes back thousands of years, and it explains a lot of why the world is the way it is. So I think, you know, one perspective is, first of all, don't be too hard on ourselves. So that's like the balance to being like super committed, like what I just said. So I'm not going to take back what I said, but I'm going to, I'm going to balance what I said, which is, you know, sometimes there might be toxic relationships and, and it's not a call to have to do it or force the issue. It's being open to do it. It could be in your family or anybody else's family. There are situations where people actually, it, there could be danger to self, um, both emotionally and, and um, you know, spiritually, mentally, interacting with some people and having space sometimes consciously is, is good as part of a process of healing. So there's not like a one size fits all. I didn't mean to Im imply that. Um, but I think it's, yeah, to do our best to look at this multidimensionally. In the Sarvodia movement, they really are achieving that. Like li literally millions of human beings who we might consider less than us in terms of not being like into, in they're not, maybe they're not into integral theory or, human developmental theory or some other theory, but th it's really happening. And um, it's, it is possible uh, to do this. So I'm not also implying that you have to wait until you have some type of, you know, a perfect balance and integrity before doing action. These things are all related. And that's what I learned, you know, go out into the community. It teaches you about yourself. You just have to see it as part of the process. And that's, I think, the first step is to open to it being part of something that's that's seamlessly related rather than separate, like it is typically in either spiritual and religious movements that see political action maybe as kind of dirty, or political social action movements that see spirituality and religion as either divisive or irrelevant or just ridiculous. So it's about bringing these worlds together, you know, 400 years ago. There was what's called the great divorce, you know, between religion and science um, in post enlightenment. And I think what happened is we probably threw the baby Jesus out with the bathwater. That is, we, you know, people in a sense critiqued the authority of religion, but they also probably separated out the interior life of connection to something deeper than ourselves, like a transcendent reality, and they marginalized it. So we're in a period of time where we have to figure out a way to put all this together, you know, traditional, modern and postmodern worldviews and integrate them all seamlessly within a multidimensional reality. Now, it's easy to say, and I just said it, but it's, it's definitely, a, it's not an easy thing uh, to do, to be mindful of it, but it's very rewarding uh, to live this kind of, you know, devotional, intentional life. We're just open. I have I have a question, Richard, that might be useful um, also for individuals that maybe aren't here is, how, where do people start with this? Really, like, if they really want to start building up this sense of this parallel, interconnected, where, where, how do, how do people start? What, what's going to get people going? You know, it's a great question. And you know, I, I don't mean for this to be like self-interested or like a crass promotion, but my plan for this, instead of building some global network, like an organization network and thinking of myself as doing this and organizing this, I'm starting to produce resources. So my book is the first uh, resource. Um, and it, it's just so hard, like, um, to convey uh, what I've been trying to convey the experience of many decades in a couple YouTube videos, like instructional videos or 
podcast and, and it's such a challenge. So I just, you know, that's why I've dedicated like three years just to finish this book. And I think it'd be really helpful. And I'm, I'm co-creating it with people. So I'm releasing a little bit at a time every Thursday on Substack. I think I'm in the beginning of section two. So I'm, I'm basically giving away the, this material for people to consider. And then for those that are really in, more interested in about a month, I'm going to be convening some calls because again, I'm not going to be just telling people like immediately, Hey, let's do this. I want to co-create this with the readers with as part of this public conversation, like that I'm doing right now. So I'm releasing this in a different way. This, this book as a kind of like a conversation starter. And then I've written most of section three, which is the how to, like, what do you do starting this, then this, then this. I want to encourage the readers to participate in co-creating that with me. I want the readers who are interested, those in the audience here that are interested, learn about what I know and in what I'm sharing, and, and then um, help help support a group process where the the vehicle that I've developed I can get reaction and then people can tell me hey this would work for me um, I would like it if we could do that so basically I'm going to be describing what I call forming a symbiotic society and a society is not just another group in a community but it is a group but it's modeled on AA so it's modeled on a recovery group like a 12-step model but it's not a 12-step thing it's actually five steps um and i call it a cultural recovery you know it's a cultural recovery group not that there was some great culture that we're modeling on the past cultural recovery would be hey let's get together and discuss and share the challenges and joys that we're having living in this reality while we're building a new one and then also build the new one so the group would have this multifaceted nature and I have some ideas about it and I'm looking to readers and maybe folks in this community to help help design it I don't know I mean I've got group everybody might have their own group small group experience let's just put our heads and hearts together and figure out what might work best to do this I have my thoughts and ideas but I wanted to wait to get feedback so I hope that was an answer Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or even anything they want to share? Um, Annie, you've unmuted. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. That was very interesting. Um, I'm curious, so because you've obviously been at this for, as you said, like a good 40 years, um, what kinds of strategies, especially earlier on, did you, um, would you say like, didn't work as well like what kind of lessons have you learned from perhaps mistakes along the way great question so i've already mentioned what comes up what gets triggered is our own woundedness so if you are moving forward with this kind of work it means that you're also open to learning and growing so i don't know if those were mistakes but those were just um it's just part of what what's happening um mistakes probably and i'm going to try to think of an example but um i would say in a in a culture where there's this ongoing culture war so there's this culture war happening bet between and amongst different factions you know mostly like social media in the us it's predominantly it's like really political Maybe it's happening in Europe the, the same way, but I don't know to the level of intensity. So one of the challenges is it's literally cultural landmines. These are preconceived notions about the nature of reality where we have biases. For example, um, one of the challenges would be if you're building, like I'll just use the, because it actually happened, like in a um, local food system network, um, somebody who's doing the work of connecting may say something like, well, um, I don't want to work with that farmer. I don't want to work with this leader of an organization because they voted for 
GW, Bush, President Bush, you know, today it would be like literally a landmine where somehow you're judging somebody as to whether you want to connect with them or work with them because they voted for in the US would be like Trump or Biden. And you have these issues that come up. See, we've defined our reality in terms of this political identification or over identification or religion. So those are the major cultural landmines to, to navigate, which requires us to um, in process, learn these things. You, you can't do it in advance really, because you can't know how you're gonna get triggered until you're triggered and you, but you have to be willing to get triggered. And, but then also work through it and then have a group to support you. Then the community helps you to kind of, you know, get in balance. And, and we would call that taking off your shoes before entering this sacred space, taking off your triggered identities, if you know you have them, to be able to somehow leave those at the door when you enter a space to create a sacred space. And those identities would be the political and religious ones. And I, I know I, I may not have answered your question because it wasn't, it was kind of personal. Um, am I getting at Aunt e, what you're addressing or do you want me to try to think of another example? I don't know, that's, it was quite an open question. Um, the oh, emphasis okay. of my question was really about like, yeah, any, whether it's concrete actions, but also, yeah, like um, patterns of thought as well. And you definitely okay. cool. elaborated in that. So, yeah, thank you. I'll follow on to that. And hey, Richard, I'll, I'll first, you know, plus, I'll plus a million on community uh, and relationality as a space for development and processing and being triggered and working through your triggers. Uh, so I guess my question would be, what is what does community look like for you these days? Hey, that's a great question, actually, because I was I was doing a um, it's called an awaken call. It's a, another amazing network uh, founded by its service space. And, then, and somebody asked me that question and I thought about it and I thought the irony of it is I'm I am kind of isolated because I've been committed to finishing my book on community. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm involved in my community, but I'm not involved in the way I was in Reno before. So that's the paradox and the irony. And I I just, yeah, I, I started working here more locally. And then I realized that I, I really, um, I really needed to focus because the best value I could provide is to, is to share, you know, what I've learned in, in the book. So then it's, it actually, uh, to be honest, been isolating. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, as the book is coming out, then what my vision would be to be available if any community wherever in the world, and there are groups of people that want to move forward that I would make myself, and my wife also said that she's a traveler, so that would work with her, that we would we would go together and, and um, um, yeah. So I guess I'm evolving now in a differently and I'm, yeah, so that create, yeah, I'm not, that's not then on an average situation. I'm, I'm, yeah, so that's what happened to me, ironically. <laughs> Anyone else? We've got about seven minutes left so we can we can carry on with any thoughts or questions or reflections. Yeah, I just have a quick question for Richard. So I, I, I like the idea of finding all the good that's out there now. I'm just curious, when you went looking for good that's out there now, did you find out anything that was no good and you just had to take a step back? <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's an interesting question because, like, um, Dr. Aryaratna, the founder of the Sarvodia movement, he, he actually was coming, you know, from a traditional Buddhist perspective, even though he expanded the range of Buddhism to include community awakening. So it was an actually, a, it's a 2,500 year innovation within the religion of Buddhism. He evolved it. He was visiting Reno where we have gambling and, and you know, there are alcohol liquor stores. So Dr. Ari's perspective as a Buddhist in those villages in Sri Lanka is 
liquor stores couldn't be included in his network. So that, that always struck me. I, I didn't see it that way. I was looking at the locality of it. Um, but yeah, the, the paradox here is if you think about it, it's a self-selecting thing. So if you, let's say you have a chapter of the, uh, I don't know, the Ku Klux Klan, like some white supremacist organization, um, it's not so much the organization itself, it's their commitment to the ideals and vision of, of the community effort, which basically would be antithetical to what they're preaching. So it's a, it's kind of like a, they wouldn't be attracted to it. And if they were, they'd have to commit to something that's totally different than their own philosophy. Like they'd have to work with, I don't know, blacks and Jews and other people that they, you know, are kind of uh, against. So that, that, that's not, that's not going to happen. Now, what's interesting is, and someone brought up a question, well, if somebody is focusing on and their identity is like anti-racism, so they're like a leader of an anti-racism organization um of course organizations like that that want to uh get involved could but why would an, an anti-racism organization or anything that's kind of like a and kind of like an oppositional political group whatever um why would they want to join a local food system network or local economy network that's promoting local food and local economy. They'd, they'd have to give up their identity. And it's just on a practical level, there's no fit there. In other words, if they enter this space of a symbiotic network, it means that they're agreeing to those uh, values, principles, the needs and the actions. So it, it's kind of a, I've seen it self-selecting, but you bring up something, something really amazing actually, which is that when we started the local food system network, the context were like restaurateurs in our town were like feeling that they were competing with each other. And the, there was a fundamental change after six months after building this broad network, which included many restaurants and all the other food system folks. Um, it shifted energetically. People are capable when the incentives to good behavior are there to operate differently. It's a, it's a secret. It's simple. It's straightforward. And it's not hard. But we're led to believe that it's impossible. But it actually, when you create the behavior incentivization from a game theoretical point of view, and they're getting benefit, and they enjoy it, they change. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the developing a symbiotic network starts with people in a core group starts with one-on-one -on -one meetings. If you're like a catalyst, Robert, in your area, it starts with you, then you identify some early adopters, you have one-on-one -on -one meetings, you're sharing energy. Really, it's sharing spiritual energy, you're sharing the idea, the vision, and you'll see if people are in alignment with that as well as the practical things. Once you determine that, then you, you do your first small group, and now you have resonance and alignment with probably the most powerful people from a spiritual perspective in your region, that is they're developed, not just intellectually about spirituality, but multidimensionally. Like they just are decent human beings and they're capable of, of goodness and it's coming out of them and that's the foundation. So it's a fractal, it's a pattern because if in each individual person, it's a pattern of the transcendent of this awakening is within each person. When the group comes together, then it naturally forms the same pattern. And I've seen this. You form a pattern of five, and then you have 10 and 15. The pattern remains, even when you have hundreds. That's because the people downline that have less interest in spirituality or inner development, but are more focused on the practical benefits, they align with the core. That's the way it is. And that's the, that actually is the secret of how this works and why it's possible to have this happen simultaneously in 50,000 villages and towns and cities in the world at the same time. I honestly have believe that and it's possible. That makes sense. Yeah. I hope I answered your question, Robert. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it sounds very, very organic. Like, you know, you you create some hybrid plant or whatever with the right DNA or whatever, then you get a small amount going and then it propagates, propagates, propagates. Absolutely. And the key is identifying what that DNA is. Because sometimes, obviously, human beings have been doing a culture of separation. Greed, avarice, empires come. That's coming out of a part of our not just biological, but cultural DNA as well. But the, the culture of connection is another part of the DNA that's also within us that is manifesting every day all over the planet. It's just overwhelmed by this other part of our, our nature. And the idea then is to emphasize, enhance the part of our cultural DNA for love, unification, collaboration, cooperation, and to actually make that real on a very practical level, starting with a person and then, you know, community uh, organizations and others, and then, you know, step by step um, inculcate that. So you're taking this literally, because I believe it's literal. It's not like a metaphor, a story. I believe there are transcendent energies, transcendent power that comes from this ultimate reality, whatever you want to call it, God, that comes through us as the virtues unifying our personality, creating order and purpose and meaning, desire to serve. And then we propagate that power. It's literally a power, like light, energy, love, through the new nodes of intersection of these new developing networks. That's literally why infrastructure is needed to then be able to receive this bottom-up, spiritual energy, transcendent energies that propagate from the bottom up. And that's how I believe we need to undergrow this system rather than overthrow it. It's, it's just not playing the same game as the way empire building is used to of thousands of years. We need another approach because nothing works to me. We can't fix the system. We can't change it from within. We can't like, because it's all on this battlefield which is the game that's being played out there. And it's hard to figure out, well, how do you get off that battlefield? How do you create a new playing field and stay in it? How do you do that? How do you stay in that, in that space? How do you hold space? It is the simplest thing, but the hardest thing. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> I think that's like a really beautiful place for us to maybe draw this to a conclusion, that really like powerful and passionate ending. I think that's really, really lovely. Um, yeah, do you have any final words you'd like to share? I'm just really happy uh, to be here. Sharing like this and in dialogue and answering questions is like my happy, happy place. To be honest, I, I just, you know, really feel honored and blessed and grateful to be in your presence, like all of you and, and in yours, Lauren, but everybody's presence. Um, as we make our way, figuring this out together and hopefully being more generous and sharing beyond the groups and silos that we're in to create more permeability amongst all of the adjacent networks and leaders and uh, that's a challenge itself, but I, I believe if we step into um, a, a generous place, we'll want to share, share connections, share projects, and and I think that's what um, I'm seeing in life itself, and it's pretty awesome what you guys are doing, and I want to support you in any way, shape, or form I can, because that's why I'm here. Like, not here in this call, but here on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Richard. Really, really appreciate your energy and your time and, and your sharing. And I've shared, once this call is is live, I'll be sharing it with our community and I'll add the links to, to your appropriate Substack and website. And awesome. yeah, ways that individuals can reach out to you if they need to or want to. Um, and obviously, you're always, always welcome back probably do another call in the future um so on that note a final thank you and i will bid everyone a farewell thank you all so much for sharing yeah, everybody energy today. take care bye bye, bye.